Michael Blue Dot. Thanks for having me on here, mate. I've been following you for a long time and it's great to finally connect. Um, I would love to also connect in person, but this is, you know, the, the second best way we can do it. So it's good to be here. Yeah, no, for sure, mate. Now, look, we, uh, we have, we have been following each other's journey and mate, I was watching, I watched your um, Ted talk and it was really good. I always love people that, um, because we all know how much of a big general fear, you know, people have towards that and you know you hear about oh you know i couldn't speak in front like what you were saying man like you know i couldn't speak in front of more than five people you know, even that was challenging and then you get into a stage where you're literally seeing the journey it's just so inspiring and i think um i think more people need to do that i think it's really good yeah i agree and it's you know it's like um it's a a tricky thing and i think um <clears throat> the reason i i've used like and it looks like with a lot of the work you do, you, you know, talking a lot from life experience, what you've had to go through to teach other people. And I think that's such an important thing because we, you know, there's a lot of people that will just say things or be positive or do this. And, and that's, you know, it might make you feel good in the moment, but that's not going to help you long term. It's not going to help you actually break down whatever it is, a fear or a blockage or, you know, whatever's stopping you. And that's what I, I learned the hard way having to, I was, you know, the uh, most shy person you'd ever meet, had no self-esteem, couldn't have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone. I, and I, I was literally like vomiting when I started doing these talks in, in um, university. And it was only because I had to stay in this course and do it because I'd been off the rails prior to that. And it was sort of the last straw. And um, it was just a process of what it, it taught me, you know, the most important lesson I apply to everything to this day um, that normally if you feel full of something, it, it, it often means you should actually you know, push yourself into it further because that's where you learn and you grow. And um, I think we live in a world where everyone wants a quick fix and everyone wants everything to happen right now and not have to actually work for it. Um, and it's just, unfortunately, that's not how it works. And I think we need more people telling people, you know, how it is rather than just saying, be positive, think great, think, think good things and it's, it's going to happen, you know? Yeah, it's so true, yeah. man. I think, you know, positivity and there's a reason we have positive emotion and negative emotion because, it, it you know, in layman's terms, it kind of regulates the, the work we're doing, good or bad. Um, what I wanted to ask, though, was I feel like a lot of the reason why people get lost on the path is because they're really unsure about whether or not the path that they're walking is right for them or what they're actually walking towards is right for them as well. And I was just interested into like, what kept you pushing through? Um, like what, what, why was public speaking so important for you? Um, I, I mean, it was, I guess it was just something I, number one, I wanted to confront a fear. Um, it sort of was a weird, weird thing for me because naturally I've actually always, you know, wanted to be on stage performing, doing things like that. That's why I'm, you know, I've been pursuing acting for five years now, but, somewhere in the middle, you know, as a kid, I was very out there and, you know, following who I, being myself and who I wanted to be. And then a lot of things happened and really um, created blockages. And uh, when the opportunity arose and I started doing it, it just sort of led to me um, continuing. Um, and another, another part, probably the bigger part of it is I, I fell into um, mental health advocacy through my own struggle, through being in a position where I was in the media, getting asked to talk about it. And I started getting asked to speak at schools and organizations and it was really a, a you know, a, a, it started building momentum. I was seeing how big of an issue it was. I was seeing that this was actually helping people. Um, and I just fell in love with doing it because, um, you know, I don't th think it was anything more fulfilling than being able to feel like in some small way you're helping someone make a, a change in their life. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, and yeah, that's yeah, sorry, mate. No, the, the best thing, approach about it is you're you're helping someone in an area that you actually have authority on and and they know that because you have been through it and they know you're the struggle and that that's like you touched on this before man like this is the way human beings have done it you know we 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 tell stories we tell stories about ourselves and we tell stories about the world in the hope that we'll get some message from those stories and that's, that's essentially what you're doing. And it's, it's kind of a, a shock that, you know, it could be so, so positive and so influential, but we need more of it 
because we've kind of lost that in this day and age. The, the, the irony, obviously, of social media is the um, yes. disconnection that's, that's growing from it. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and as you're saying, it, it's so true. We, um, you know, we need more of it. And it feels when you're doing it and sh- when I'm sharing a story, a lot of the time I felt like, you know, surely is this really going to help someone? I'm, you know, saying similar things a lot of the time. But you realise it, it's needed more than ever because people are screaming for, you know, honesty and realism, but they don't know how to, how to approach it a lot of the time. And it's not their fault. It's social conditioning. Um, Like you said, social media, we're living in a world where people are living behind a lens and putting on this facade about what they think their life should be. And they're not actually getting that opportunity to just take that step back and think, what do I actually want to do? And who do I want to be? What do I care about? What's, what are my values? You know, all that sort of thing. We don't have, we don't get that chance a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. That, that's a that's a big topic of discussion on this podcast. It's about um, you know that finding that meaning and, and that purpose, and it it starts um, with asking for help. Like, oh, excuse me, how how did you find meaning? You know, not to, not to just start off in such a deep way. How did you find meaning in your life, mate? But like, what exactly getting you out of bed every day? Because I, you know, let's just say for example, you know, you're in that rut. It's like I can't seem to find the energy to get out of bed every day. Like, what gets you out of bed? It's like you know, very quickly people start talking about what's truly important in life. You know, their the loved ones, the experiences they get at a at a job or, or something they do that fulfills them, you know, all, all that sort of thing. Um, you know, at the end of the at the talk you were speaking about um the Golden Gate Bridge and how many people um tend to jump off that and my mate and I we used to do a podcast together and we were lucky enough to actually interview the he's called the guardian of the golden gate bridge. His name's Kevin Briggs. For a long time, he was responsible for actually talking people down. Have you heard of Kevin Briggs? Well, I haven't. No, I, um, I'll have to, I'll look this up after. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Dude, his Ted talk is, is crazy. And what's what Uh, the most amazing thing I got from, from speaking to him was that you think about suicide as this very kind of, touchy subject like oh my god they're suicidal they're doing this they're doing this you know but you mentioned this in in your talk it's they are just dying for someone to say hey i can see you you know i know you exist like let's have a conversation and kevin briggs was, was saying the exact same thing he said you know obviously there were some cases where it didn't go to plan which is very unfortunate and that would that would take a toll on him psych on him psychologically but more often than not he was very easily able to talk these people down because they just felt so disconnected and so depressed that by him just standing there and listening to them for an hour, 20 minutes, he told me um, he once stood there for eight hours in the rain speaking to this person before they came off the bridge. Just that is all they needed. And that's the difference between life and death. It was just ridiculous. Unbelievable. And yeah, it's a scary thing, isn't it? It's like, um, and I think, you know, a lot of people have, maybe not been to that point, but I think most of us can relate in some way when we've, you know, been in that dark spot, our mind, you know, goes on that trail and we um, build up these scenarios and you get into that emotional state. And um, it is, it's just people want to be heard. They need to um, understand that, you know, when we are going through that period, it's not going to be forever. No emotion, you know, good or bad lasts forever, but it's a, um, yeah, it's a pretty, terrifying thing with how big big of a problem it's become um and uh, yeah, there can't be enough done about it i think i, I actually saw you another thing you had posted yesterday that you'd reposted what russell brand said and i thought that was um fantastic i i, I love russell brand i love that oh, he, you know cele- using his celebrity to say something like that and you know it's just like i was like fuck that's that's awesome that's you know that made me feel like oh a lot of the stuff that i've thought about in the past just seeing that, you know, you, you hear it from these people, it has an impact and it, it just shows we all need to do, I think if everyone could just in, make some sort of effort to do, you know, one small thing to, to help in this area, it, it'll make a massive change. Ma- massive, man. Yeah, for sure. What was, it like, what was it like for you, Nico? Like, you know, I think your OCD sounded very similar to mine where it just it was kind of like a frog in boiling water. Like you started to do these compulsions essentially and it was like wasn't until you kind of had that time to look back on yourself you're like oh shit this is this is becoming a a bit of a big deal like did you when you first realized that did you ask for help or what was kind of your the first step on your on your journey to recovery uh yeah it was a very long 
sort of drawn out road. Um, I, I mean, it manifested for me in sport. I, I was always into sports and it sort of progressively got worse and it, it was an obsession. Um, I was like just training crazy amounts, like seven hours a day as an 11, 12 year old kid. And I was like having to hide it from my parents. They knew it was a problem, but they didn't know to what extent. And it was this weird compulsion where I even logically, I remember even thinking back to, to then, logically I knew that, the level of training wasn't actually going to help me perform better. Um, I was training <laughs> in middle distance running at the time. Um, but I had this thing in my head where I thought I have to, I, I can't sleep at night unless I know there is not one person out there that is going to, is doing more than me. And it was just all this illogical stuff. And it sort of evolved um, in, it, it sort of like evolved in different areas of my life. And it, it actually wasn't really until I, had a breakdown basically i i was very depressed i'd finished at school i was lost i had no social skills i had dropped out of university courses i actually didn't touch alcohol until i was 19 and overnight that became the new thing i used basically to to cope and and when i would drink it was again an illogical thing not i, I wanted to push myself to the extreme and it didn't make sense but it was because I think, you know, these thoughts that were so incessant, I just couldn't handle them. It was just like, this is too much. I need a break. Um, so it was finally when I started working through all of that, I, I did ask for help. Um, and I started talking to a psychologist. I started through the mental health work, really. It was sort of, that was why it was so liberating. I, um, I remember telling my best friend about it when I first um, was suffering from depression and getting help for it when I first discovered, you know, I didn't really know a lot about it at this age, but I remember telling her and I was like trembling and I was thinking, she's never going to speak to me again. You know, she's going to judge me. She's not going to look at me the same. And uh, she was so important. She was there for me, didn't judge me. And, and it, from there it sort of escalated and it just became, um, you know, this relief that I can talk about it and, and it got easier and easier, but you know, um, I don't know what it's like with you, but, I still have a lot of those obsessive tendencies that I look at as an incredibly positive thing because I can hyper focus. I, um, you know, it means that I do often get things done in the way I want, but if I'm not careful, that can very quickly um, become unhealthy. So it's this continual, you know, balancing act. Yeah, that's, that's a, such a good way of looking at it, mate. And, uh, you know, there are fine lines between, you know, classifying yourself as someone that has mental health issues and classifying you some, you know, not necessarily classifying yourself, but saying something like, you know, I have these things that I need to pull back from time to time, but on the whole, I look at them as a positive. And, you know, I think a really great way of doing that is you can look at life as though it's happening to you or, or, or though it's happening for you. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's a great place for, for people to start. And even with, I mean, the biggest thing for me was the thoughts, the intrusive thoughts, mm -hmm. you know, and what I did was essentially I was just getting into Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud and I was starting to fucking froth psychoanalytics. So I started to have a look at, you know, the reasons why they may have been prevalent for me. Like why was I getting these bizarre thoughts? Because just trying to get rid of them was actually ironically leading to more compulsive behavior, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you start going into that, into yourself a little bit and have a look about um, why they may be the case. And it wasn't long before I could start to kind of map where, you know, if you can picture like an authentic path, I'd started to skew based on perceptions as myself and based on, you know, what other people said, I, you know, what I thought I should do this and that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that just before as well. I was, I was wondering if you could go into that. Yeah. So with perceptions of what you think people are thinking versus the actual reality. Um, well, you said before so like, as you were starting to grow up, you know, you were starting to move into this world of, I need to do this, you know, based on what other people were saying. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, how, yeah. how did that, those external cues kind of frame this compulsive narrative? Oh yeah. Ma majorly. Um, I mean, and it was probably elevated for me um, to a degree because I grew up in a, a well-known family. My dad mm -hmm. was uh, the premier of Victoria and, um, that probably with my personality more than my brother and sister. And because I was the eldest, I was sort of in the media and people, you know, knew our family and I got referred to sit from probably the age of, you know, 12 till even now, a lot of the time in Australia, um, the son of Steve Brax, which I love my dad, you know, he's one of my heroes, but I, it was like a dagger for me every time, you know, um, 
I'm fucking Nick Brax. I'm not the son of <laughs> Steve Brax. Well, I am. Yeah. The, I am, but that's not my title. You know, I'm my own person. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it, was, it was this fuel where I was like, okay, I need to do something extreme. I need to become, what can I do? How can I become famous? How can I, you know, become a bigger deal than my father? So it is now Nick Brax. Um, and it was sort of that with also, I guess, you know, insecurities, I felt like, if I became an, a professional athlete, that would validate me because I wasn't enough without that. Uh, after that, it was more when that couldn't happen anymore. How do I make a lot of money was what I wanted to do in business mm-hmm. and then fame. And um, <clears throat> it was, yeah, really driven by all of the wrong reasons. And the funny thing is I only started having success in what I've been doing when I started doing it from a reason of meaning and not actually wanting the material things out of it obviously that's great if it happens we all want more money i want that to happen but i'm not doing it for that reason and that's when i've started getting results so you know it's it's a it's a huge thing and it's something that i think once you understand it it's just this you know it makes life so much easier but how do how do we get you know more people to to think that way it's a it's a it's a process oh man that that is a brilliant point you know it, it really is and i reckon i don't know this is just me thinking kind of you know, off the cuff, but like that, I reckon that need for external validation would be a really kind of like male thing. It's probably, I mean, it's probably prevalent with girls as well, but I can just see that being like, fuck, I need to be someone, you know, I need, I got to go and do this. Yeah, Exactly right. When you remove the need, um, well, when you start doing things for intrinsic reasons, as opposed to external reasons, like, you know, I need to make the AFL. That was my thing as well, actually, dude. Made the AFL. Oh, right. Yeah. Was, interesting. Bless you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was yeah. for me, funnily enough, it was because I wanted my dad's validation. Um, I didn't necessarily. Similar want thing, yeah. yeah. But I wanted, um, I wanted him to validate me more than he did. I love the big guy, but he's, he's a quiet fellow. Yeah. So it was the same sort of thing. And then, but yeah, it's that, that thing in life of, and it should yeah. be second nature to us, but we, we've kind of lost that. Like what, what would you do in life that, just makes the time fly, you know? And for, for a lot of people, it's a creative outlet. Mm, mm, absolutely. And, and, you know, I was thinking about what you were saying before with, I think it all does come down to, you know, meaning and purpose. And um, for me, I, and I, you know, I have struggles daily and I'm like, you know, there's different things that I think we all do, but at the core, I'm like, I feel like, like, like I'm one of the luckiest people alive because every single day I get to do, what I love doing and but underneath that there's a bigger meaning and even with the acting the acting sort of almost secondary that the number one thing is I want to make change in mental health and that's just it it's really simple it doesn't matter what vehicle that's in it doesn't matter how that arises but every single day it's like is this going to help me make that change and it, it really does simplify everything and then if I find myself obsessing about I want to you know, but what about this friend who's you now making more money than me or that guy who's, you know, that actor that's doing more or this or that, then you're like, okay, you know, bring it back. What do I actually care about? Oh, that's what it is. And it's um, because, you know, it's like, it's so hard not to get drawn into that stuff unless you want to go and live in a cave, you know, and uh, you, you've got people trying to, you know, compare egos and talk about all these different things and it fuels people's insecurity. So it's, it's, it's just such a critical thing, I think, that we find that. Yeah. And I mean, people get lost because, you know, they hear people say things like, oh, you know, I get to do what I love every day. And it's like, fuck, I wish I had that. But the person that's living that life didn't just one day decide I'm going to live my life as though I love it and do what I get to do every day. It's like, no, these are incremental right. changes. Like you didn't get to that position, yeah. you know, overnight. You probably got to that incrementally by earning a bit more money, mm-hmm. working a lot harder on the weekends and then slowly kind of filtering that into your working life. And it, it takes a long time. And you're exactly right, man, that, and we all do it. You know, I think it's a part of our evolutionary circuitry to compare, to analyze, you know, to, to perceive mm-hmm. threat. But if we mm-hmm. can just learn or, or at least just catch ourselves comparing ourselves to other people, as opposed to, as the cliche goes, who we were yesterday, it, it's going to be, it's going to be an easier fight because you're not fighting. Oh, for sure. For sure. And I love, yeah, I love the way, you know, you put all that and it's, and it's just something that's so important to keep realizing that, um, we all want more meaning. And I think meaning is one of the, you know, important things that everyone needs, but you don't, you don't just find it. You don't just have an epiphany. You don't wake up. You, you sort of work for meaning. And, you know, I, if I, when I first started in mental health, I knew nothing about it, but I did it. I've done it. Like you said, I've done it for 10 years now. I've been done, you know, 
hundreds, almost probably in the thousands of talks. And now I'm like, well, I feel like an authority authority figure in that area. And that is meaningful because it's part of my, such a big part of me. So, but you've got to sort of fight for that really. Yeah. And you've cultivated it. You've built it yourself. You can look back on it and you're like, wow, I actually built that from the ground up. You know, um, there's, there's a great book. Um, it's called Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. And okay, basically, yeah. yeah, it's really good. It's, it's basically, it's fucking scary, dude. He um, wrote this book based on what a world would be like where this elite class could tyrannize the rest of the population because they made them feel like they were actually free um, when they were just giving them these, these soma pills is what they called them. Um, and they could just do the worst work. It's very scary if you think about antidepressants and kind of how we live in this day and age. But yeah, yeah. The, um, the kind of idea behind that was um, there was a, there was a prologue written by some, some fellow who wrote the um, prologue to the book. And there was a part in his prologue that really stood out to me. And he said something like when everything is free and available, nothing has any meaning. And yep. it got me thinking about what you were saying just then, you know, we have access to so much, like you go on Netflix and it takes us hours to choose a movie just because we've got everything we could ever hope for and more, you know, even what we're doing now, you know, the worst thing we complain about is fucking slow Wi-Fi, you know, but you've got to live in Bali. Right. And then there's a lady there who's working 15 hours a day, smiling her head off purely mm-hmm. because she has a job. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I've seen that in, I, I think about that a lot and um, it is, it's exactly like you're saying. And, and when I've been in Africa, I was in India last year, um, you know, connecting with all these locals that were basically in poverty, you know, had, had nothing good didn't even have proper shelter, but they, they were happy and you can see they're happy and they're connected. And um, a lot of it is because they don't even, they don't have, it can't enter their psyche that there's even an opportunity for something different. You know, we all have the luxury of thinking, okay, if I don't like this job I'm doing, or I want to go travel here or do this, like I can probably do it. Yeah. They are literally like, if I don't get up and find food and, you know, look after my family and get fresh water or whatever, I will die. And there is no other option for me that that doesn't exist. That's dreamland. So this is my reality. So I'm like so immersed, so present in it. And they actually, they're happy because that, that's a fundamental of what we all need. It's just connection and being present and, you know, just really immersing in what you're doing. But um, it's the, the positive and negative of the, of the world we live in right now, where things are, like you said, incredibly available. It is overwhelming. Even if you, you know, you, how do you make a decision? like you said, with Netflix and things like that, when it was just yeah. opportunities. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, you know, because they, because their role is just so, you know, like we, you're exactly right. Like we have to get this food. We have to get this water. We have to, you know, we have to, I have to work today or else my family will starve. I mean, I mean, that's a, what better analogy or example could you have of a meaningful life because you have so much responsibility that rests upon you. And when you actually fulfill your job, it's like, I feel pretty good about myself, you know? <laughs> for sure. For sure. And I think that's why um, a lot of incredibly wealthy people end up so depressed. And I, I know I've met quite a few people that have had in- extreme wealth, but have been very, very unhappy. And it's because you sort of lose meaning and you have all that money and it's like, okay, great that's a good opportunity to be able to do things more meaningful. But a lot of the time it becomes, no, I need more. And how do I, you know, uh, I want as much as that guy has now, or I want to be a billionaire now because I'm worth this. And and that's, and then you become depressed because it's like, hang on, I'm meant to, I should be the happiest person in the world because I've got every, I've got seemingly what we all want. I got it. How come I'm still unhappy? Now I'm more unhappy because the thing that I fought for and almost killed myself for, in some cases, a lot of these people actually almost do die from, stress you know years of stress and having heart attacks from pushing i got it i'm still unhappy okay now i'm like really at rock bottom so it's like it's 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 this skewed thing isn't it yeah definitely man i was interested what your because you've done a lot of these talks um what do you see as because i'm sure you've done talks at um high schools and things like that yeah yeah in schools and um companies mainly yeah. I was just interested in what you kind of see um, is happening with like our kids and, you know, just the, the rise of this social media age and some of the dangers that are associated with kind of like the way they live, they live their life. Oh, so many. It's, it's pretty, it's scary. Um, I mean, cyberbullying, 
things like that are hugely prevalent. Um, kids, I think, are having a, a lot more so having an identity crisis a lot of the time because they don't know what they should be because they're presented with so many different things. Um, they don't know how to speak up, I think. Um, as you are saying before, for, for, for males, a lot of the time, they, they don't feel like it's okay to talk about different issues. But, you know, on the, on the extreme end, there are people, um, kids committing suicide from cyberbullying. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very serious thing. So it's a, um, yeah, a big issue. And it's, uh, again, not a simple thing. This is all very complicated. And it's great that there is now more awareness about it. There's more um, education being put into, into schools. But it's only bit really only touching the surface. There needs to be a huge change. I think it, it, it should be a compulsory part of this all schooling that we get taught about. You know, it's a, it's a, for me, that's the thing that's a, the biggest change that needs to be made long term. You know, we yes, we need to have services out there for all age groups, but we're only going to make long change until we, on that societal level, completely restructure how we're taught. You know, if I, if I was taught from a young age, and this is from parenting as well, it's not our parents' fault, they're, you know, generationally, um, things need to change. They've been... Yeah taught to a lot of the time not to express and not how, not knowing how to do it. We don't get taught it in school. Then we have to work it out ourselves later. And if that can change, that's how you make such a big difference long term. Yeah, definitely. I, I was listening to um, Seth Godin talk, um, marketing guru. And, yeah. um, you know, he was talking about how the reason why, I'm not sure how kind of congruent this is to the Australian um, schooling system, but, the reason why kind of public schooling came into being was so that we could produce more factory workers. You know, it's that individualism you stand here. And I mean, that just takes away any kind of sense of that meaning and all that sort of thing that we're talking about. But dude, like it would just be a fascinating school to, to attend to or to have attended to, or, you know, we have kids one day to put our kids through where the first thing they're talking about isn't necessarily just history and textbooks and all that sort of stuff. But it's like, metacognition you know like how to think how to connect like take guys welcome to connection 101 we're gonna look each other in the eye for five minutes not saying anything and then we're just gonna have a talk about that shit like that you know that just going back down to that kind of tribal stuff that's worked for hundreds of thousands of years you know we were getting eaten by jaguars and we weren't doing (laughs) the best thing all the time but we had some stuff that was going all right (laughs) Absolutely. No, I think, yeah, it would be fascinating to see what the end outcome come was from that. And I think it would be a vastly better outcome. Um, and, you know, a lot of the other, it, it, I, I just have always felt like the whole world is, is, is backwards. It's like, okay, this is what you do. You've got to go to school, go to university, get a job, make money, have a family, do this, then have your breakdown, then, you know, then sort of learn who you are. When it's too late, when, you know, you, your life's almost done. Like some people want to do those things, nothing against that. But um, in, it's like, why can't we have the opportunity before we go and do make all these commitments and do all these things to actually find who we are and what we want to spend our life doing? If we can do that, then we're probably going to be 10 times more successful anyway because you're going to love what you're doing. You're going to be, you know, it's not going to be work, but uh, it's not how we're, we're taught to approach it. So it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a weird thing. Mm, that's classic. The 45 year old, <laughs> oh, you know, my mental breakdown isn't scheduled for another couple of years, mate. I'm all right. <laughs> that's all Hold on for another. Yeah. I, I, I can have permission to do it at 55. Not quite yet. 45 is yeah. too young. <laughs> yeah. I'm too early, mate. Fucking hell. <laughs> too, early. Oh, fuck. You're too early. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so yeah. What, what was the move to Canada? Uh, so I've come, just wanted a bit of a, a change from Australia. I mean, I'm living between here and Melbourne at the moment. Yeah. Um, I've been pursuing acting for, a while now and done a few things in Australia, but there's a huge industry um, in, in Vancouver, actually, they call Vancouver North Hollywood. Um, So, so I've come over here really uh, just to extend the the mental health work that I'm doing and and audition for a lot of work over here. So um, yeah. And and just for, for a personal challenge too, it's one of those things where I'm 32 now I've traveled a lot. I did a gap year when I was 19, but I've had this sort of, gnawing gnawing thing inside of me where I've wanted to live overseas and you know be not know anyone and have to you know but doing it when I already knew know who I am and you know start again almost and um I just thought well when am I going to do it if I don't do it soon I can do it now um I might as well just do it yeah there's there's certainly more you know not, not not that you can like 
if you're always locked down once you have a family and kids, but there's certainly less barriers if you don't have those sorts of things. Um, yeah. which is good. And again, it's another example of, um, I'm not apologizing for, um, some of the opportunities that we have because I'm fucking pumped to be, you know, <laughs> you know, I want to travel as much as I bloody can, but like, you know, just being aware of how good that is, you know, just taking those opportunities and just be like, yeah, this is, this is, if I'm, if I'm going to be born, to uh, a couple of parents that decided Australia was their home turf. I'm just going to make the most of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think we forget that, don't we? And I, can, mm. I have to, whenever I like sort of um, start complaining about things, I just try and remind myself that I'm like, Fuck, well, how lucky are we that we born, yeah. were born in Australia? Just, you know, even just that, regardless of what you do with your life, it's a, it's a privilege, you know, it's like mm. a, a huge portion of the world don't have that opportunity. Why not make the most of it? Dude, Melbourne is like the pleasure town of pleasure towns. It's <laughs> insane. Like we can, the fact that we can legitimately complain about our smashed avocado is just like ridiculous. I love doing it. I love complaining about smashed avocado. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say you've got to complain about something. Exactly. Um, but I think, <laughs> I think traveling, you know, traveling gives you more perspective about how good Melbourne is. Every time I travel, Every time I go to a new place, it's just like, like, you know, Melbourne is one of the best cities, if not the best in, in the world mm-hmm. where we are, you know, very fortunate. Yeah. And there's a really good um, psychological perspective on, on what you just said, you know, for people that, um, cause I'm always trying to think about how, you know, we can kind of add little practical tools and steps in, in these sorts of podcasts and yeah. um, challenge is, is one of them. You know, if you find that you're really struggling to kind of, move through the day, uni's hard, work's hard, all this sort of thing. Um, try fast for 24 hours. See if you can do it, you know, or just take something yeah. away because like, you know, a, a big pizza when you've kind of already eaten lunch, afternoon tea, not very appealing, but a small biscuit to someone that hasn't eaten in four days is like the definition of happiness. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. So true. Just switching that perspective, isn't it? And, and um, and it, it sort of takes you out of the situation and shows you, you know, what what's what's actually going on. It, it's a crazy thing. And um, I also find like um, I was having a conversation yesterday with someone about anxiety, and you know, I think I think with anxiety a lot of the time, like I know for me and from what I've seen other people and the work I do, it's like the the natural reaction we have when we're anxious or overwhelmed is to withdraw and go and you know hide away from it and naturally what happens then is you ruminate on it it becomes a bigger and bigger problem you get more anxious and then it's harder to get out of so really i think with that kind of thing the best solution is you just got to face it head on and again accept this is uncomfortable i'm going to be uncomfortable for a period of time until i get you know what i need done but let's put this into perspective it might be a day a week two weeks whatever it is but it's really not that long amount of time and then you know you otherwise you have these things sitting inside of you that just don't get dealt with and become bigger issues Man, you know what? I, I think um, I think more people need to say what you just said there. You know, we we look at. I think mental health awareness is absolutely sensational and absolutely needed. You know, but when we think about, you know, anxiety and depression, it's okay. You're going to get through it. Yes, but on top of that, anxiety and depression to a certain extent, you can have a look at what bonobos do in the wild, but they're actually signals that are trying to help you in life. You know, yeah. the, the reason we have anxiety is obviously to, to perceive threats and all that sort of stuff, but cause and effect landscape, you're hungry and you don't have any food around you. The anxiety and the cortisol and adrenaline rises. Oh shit. I've got no food around me. It forces you, motivates you through that pain cycle to actually go and find food. And then the anxiety comes down. What happens in this, society in the day we live in, in this day and age is that we we experience an emotion like anxiety it's uncomfortable i've heard that you know mental health issues are a real thing i need to go and i need to get out of my head could it not be that it is a signal trying to tell you something maybe i'm not connecting with the people at work maybe this work isn't meaningful maybe what i'm doing in life is too difficult and i'm trying to compartmentalize too many stressful mm-hmm. situations it is happening for you you know uh, so yeah, no, I love that. And it's so true. It is like, it is telling you, you need to make a change. And that's what, you know, that's what I in through the mental health awareness work I'm doing. That's what I try and get across a lot of the time. I'm sort of mm. a lot of the strategy I try and put across are saying, I'm, you know, let's not sugarcoat things. If you want to change it, it's going to be hard, but this is why it's telling you this. 
this is why you're feeling that. It's not, you know, you can't just sort of wish something away or block it or whatever it is. Um, I see it so much in um, the entertainment world, in, in especially, you know, with different actors I meet. And you, I, I meet people that, and I don't blame them, I feel very bad for them and I have to navigate it myself. I feel fortunate I've got my business so I can, you know, navigate that world. But I see it every day with people I meet. They are having breakdowns, not even on a daily basis, multiple breakdowns a day because they're, yeah. at, there's no security. Um, they're fighting for this thing that they don't know they, they're going to get. They're having to, you know, put themselves out there. It's like, well, when you have a conversation with them and say, well, look, you know, do you think maybe it's because of this? Maybe you could just find somewhere in the middle, still pursue it. But, the, you know, there's a few fundamental problems here. Rather than addressing it, I just see so often that they will uh, try and, you know, say positive things or, you know, hope, live off hope that no, 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 it's, like, it's going to be okay. I'm going to, I'm going to get that big role and it'll be fixed. It's like, no, you've got fundamental things. You've got to address it right now. You're overwhelmed and it will not go away. It'll get worse, but you can't, you just, yeah, you see it in so many areas. Yeah. That's actually like, no man, you're fucked at the moment. <laughs> Tomorrow, <laughs> let's be a little less fucked. <laughs> that's it. <yeah. laughs> oh God. It's that whole thing. Like we all, um, we're taught that, no, I'm going to be okay and better when this happens or this. So it's like, no, if you can't get yourself okay right now, you're not going to, you know, that's going to be like a drug. It's going to, you know, probably give you a high and block it for a bit, but you're not going to, the same problems resurface until we fix them. Definitely. Oh man, that's so true. There's a fucking good couple of nuggets in here, mate. I'm loving them. <laughs> that it's that that's the fundamental idea of expediency, you know, means to ends. This will be good when, you know, once I have enough money then, and you can yeah. find, that. you know, it's kind of what you and I were doing. Like I'll be okay. Once all this training pays off and I make the AFL, it's like, well, you only ever have right now, you know, um, You've got that. what would you do right now? You know, if you had all, if you had all that stuff, um, cause I reckon a lot more people would start to realize that it's more about just having conversations like this, you know, doing boring, classic human stuff. Oh mate. So, so much so like, it's crazy. And when, when I break things down, um, I was, I was thinking about it a while ago. I was like, I was stressing about some stuff. I was like, hang on. I was getting caught up in all of that. I was like, oh no, but I need to, you know, make more money or do this or get it. I was like, hang on, what do I actually enjoy? And I was like, the stuff I enjoy doesn't actually require me to really have any money. Like I, I love what we're doing, what we're doing right now. I could do this all day, every day, just talk about all this kind of stuff that I find fascinating. I love working out. I love, you know, communicating. I love doing the talks. I love trying all that stuff that, mm. you know, it's like, so I think if we can fall in love with process rather than results, it just changes everything. And you see it, you know, again, going back, I use the acting stuff as like an analogy just because I'm in that area, but a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of them are like, I want to be an actor so I can be famous or I can, you know, whatever. It's like, but do you actually like what you're doing? And the ironic thing is the ones that do become famous are doing it because they love the process of doing it. It's not about whether they actually get that end result or not. And we need to apply that to whatever the hell we're doing. Otherwise, what's the point? We only ever have the process. Mm, oh man, definitely. You know, I was, I was having a, this chat, exact chat with um, Steve Monaghetti and I was yeah. trying to really get to the bottom of why he became such a bloody good marathon runner. And he said, you know, you know, people would come to me all the time and they would say, Oh, you know, you, you know, you're so naturally talented, you know, you're so, you're so good. You know, how do you get good? And, um, he would all, often time again, he would just be like, well, no, it's just because I like doing it. I, I would just, you know, it's like no shit. He became really good because if he really enjoys it, he's just going to do it more often than someone that doesn't enjoy doing it. It's pretty log it's logical, but you know, we we don't like to hear that because that's not that's not glamorous, that's not easy, that's not obtainable overnight. You know, we we especially in, you know, the this Instagram generation, we don't want to hear any of that. I was listening to a s I was listening to um do you follow Jay Shetty? You, you yes. to his, I was listening to his um podcast interview with um Kobe Bryant yesterday and um Kobe was talking about the same thing. He was like, Everyone's like, You're so naturally gifted, how did you become so, you know, incredible? as a basketball player and, and now in the other work he's doing, he's writing and all this stuff. And he said, look, it's not um, rocket science. I, and I'm not naturally gifted. He's like, I work and I develop the process and I do it habitually every single day. For You know, I did it for 10 years and then I got started getting progress. And he's like, that's how you do it. But you don't stick to it if you don't love it and you don't develop routine and, you know, have that sort of rigidity in what you're doing. 
Mm, exactly. Exactly right, man. Um, so it's like, yeah. Well, yeah. Sorry. Go. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I was cutting off. I was, was going to say I could, I, I could talk all day about all this stuff. There's so many tangents we could go on. So it's, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah, no. I just wanted to some other examples for yourself, mate. Like, what are, what are some things for you that you know? Um, that you just find yourself you're in the flow state, um, things like that, you know, like what, why is acting such a intrinsic, um, you know, thing of value for you? Acting for me. Um, I, I was, uh, yeah, I think the first thing I, I learned in, in acting school, the first thing I got taught was we are now going to, you're going to unlearn everything you've been taught for the last 25 years. Oh, wow. Um, and what I mean by that, or what he meant was, you know, like you were talking about earlier with all of this social conditioning and the stuff we're not taught in school about, like you said, you know, how about you look someone in the eyes and just, you know, be still and look at each other for five minutes. Most people can't do it. Like these are all the things you get taught in acting. And uh, to to be a a really good actor, you have to be able to be completely have no ego, be comfortable with yourself, you know, let go of things, understand other people. And I got fascinated, fascinated about it from that. I actually, I got into it for the wrong reason. I, um, I was on a reality show and in the media and I was young and naive and um, didn't know who I was. And I thought, this feels great. You know, I'll, people know who I am. I want more of this. What can I do? Oh, maybe acting. Got into it. Uh, probably after the first class I went to, I thought, fucking hell, this, I'm not going to last in this if um, for that. And then I, I stuck at it. And then I thought, this is completely different to, you know, eventually I was like, I don't care if I even get work in this. This is the best fucking self-development thing I've ever done because you're having to just be present, listen to someone, you know, understand you, you have to understand yourself completely to be able to play different characters, understand other people. And I found it fascinating and um, just another way to be able to connect and communicate and tell stories. And, um, you know, a lot of people actually say to me, they're like, it's so contradictory that, you know, you're you're doing two vastly different things. You're a mental health advocate and you're pursuing acting. I'm like, actually, you know, when you, when I really break it down, they're, they're all, they're both, very very similar it's about communication really and and telling a story yeah exactly that's why i wrote yeah Yeah. do you have any other ones like writing playing music other things i other sort of hobbies i love doing or uh, yeah um i i need to find more i um i was talking to someone about this the other day as well actually and they're saying nick you got to go and you know find a hobby that's not about work and i agree because probably the big the one problem i have now is i run my mental health business um and i do acting and it it really means pretty much you know if i really think about it um basically from the moment i wake up to the moment i go to bed if i'm not working on one of the two things i'm thinking about it and <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. switch off for it. it's an obsession to a degree um but it's not healthy you know it means i can get burnt out and um it would be good to have a healthy outlet. So, um, I mean, for me at the moment, I've, I've trained my whole life. I love exercise. I love, you know, I'm in Vancouver right now. I love going for a hike, getting in nature, all that kind of stuff. I just, I love. Um, but I think it would be good to find some other hobby that's purely just for the sake of doing the hobby. <laughs> just for the hobby. Dude, you can look at it two ways. Like an obsession is like a you know, I have to do this. It comes from like a need, you know, of scarcity. It's very negative, but, um, what you're doing sounds like it's, it's just all about devotion. Like you're giving because it's what you love to do and it helps other people at the same time. So I think, um, yeah. devoted to acting in mental health, which is just sick. Yeah, no, thank you, man. But, um, yeah, I pro- probably do need to find a little bit of balance occasionally, but at the same time, <laughs> yeah, like, like you're saying, it's like, it's, um, it is. I feel fortunate and I think probably similar to you that, um, yes, we all want, you know, obviously we all want more money or whatever because life's expensive and we need things to do, to do stuff. But at the core, I think, I think the luckiest people in the world are the ones that just get to do something that they truly love mm-hmm. and that gives them meaning every day. And you know, there's not a lot of people that are living their life that way from, from what I see anyway. Man, I don't know about you, but um, I'm in the mental health game just to get heaps of checks and millions of dollars. So, <laughs> <laughs> Mate, that's the real reason I put it on Tinder exactly. that I'm in health. And, you know, it's like that's, that's the latest sort of thing, isn't it? It's, it's cool yeah. to be in mental health. So <laughs> yeah. That's oh, the real man, reason. Fuck. This guy has anxiety. Look how hot he is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Look how vulnerable that guy is. I, I, want, yeah. I want to go on a date with him. <laughs> that's right. 
He's, he's so courageous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a real oh, man. There you go. <laughs> I love it. When you go, what's, um, what's next for you, mate? What's, what's coming up? Uh, I am, so I'm actually launching a digital side of the mental health work I, I do. So, um, um, probably in the next two weeks, I'll have that up and running. So it's mainly video education. I've brought on a whole range of different experts and made, um, a mental health education package basically that I'm going to be putting out there. So really it's, it's been a lot of work, but I'm, yeah, I'm super excited to get it out there. And, um, that's been, you know, really the sort of biggest thing I'm, I'm working on right now. Yeah. Oh, mate, that's awesome. Yeah. Chuck us um, chuck us all the links, and we'll. By the time that launches, I think this podcast will be up. So, you can chuck us all the links, and oh, we'll, we'll get it out. Yeah, perfect, mate. Appreciate it. I will. I'll send it through. Sure. Well, mate, thanks so much for coming on the show. This this definitely won't be uh, the first and only time. It will be the first, but it won't be the last. Uh, hopefully, next time we can do it in person, man. It'd be good. Absolutely, mate. I'd love to do another one. We'll do one in Melbourne or whenever we meet in person. But yeah, thank you for having me on here. I've been, you know, been wanting to do this with you for a while. And, uh, you know, I love all the work you're doing. It's uh, very engaging and inspiring. And it's, it's great to chat with you. So thank you. Oh, legend. All right, Tim. Well, thanks for tuning in. And uh, that's a wrap. <laughs>